So welcome to Workforce Development Office Hours. Um, my name is Susan Sons. I serve as Chief Security Analyst at IU Center for Applied Cybersecurity Research. Um, that makes me Deputy Director of Research SOC. I also work on the CICOE pilot and several other projects. Um, most recently, I've had the wonderful experience of getting to build the Research SOC, which is a security operations center focused on research and also bring up a fractional CISO program and train a whole new um, workforce of CISOs within CACR, which has been really fun for me. So um, I'm mostly here to take other people's questions. I did put a slide together with a couple of resources that I thought would be helpful. Um, so you'll see me flip to the slide when I refer to things just so that people can grab them. Um, Daniel Lapine, I hope I'm saying your last name correctly, is here from NCSA. He's giving a wonderful talk at 2.30 Eastern today on their CI internship professional program. And I'm really looking forward to that. And he's gonna be able to answer some questions too. Um, these are also some things that I hope you'll beg, borrow, or steal. Um, manager tools is something I use extensively. Um, they've got a lot of things for managers. They've also got a career tools podcast that can be really useful for your directs. Um, and they do a lot of things on how do you help coach your people and make professional development part of their daily lives, not just something that you do and try to buy in as a course. And then um, here are a couple things that I built um, because we had a question that I'll answer if we have time about um, how to build trainings when you need to do it in house. And this just has a lot of links to resources for early and mid career professionals that I hope that you'll suck up and use when you're training your own people. So um, I will make the slides available so you have all of those links, but those are out there. So I wanna hear from you guys, what are your questions? And keep in mind that when I have slides up, I can't actually see chat. So asking me questions out loud, or if you put them in chat, maybe Loic will be kind enough to relay for me. Yes, I would. <laughs> Okay, everybody's pretty quiet. So I'll start with one of the questions that I got in um, the registration. So one of the pe things people asked about is, um, they said that they're interested in designing a basic workshop for their user community. And um, what are, how do they figure out what their bare minimum content is? And that's one of the ones, um, that's why I mentioned this uh, Building Great Trainings. Uh, that's links to a slide deck that I used for an internal training here at CACR when I was teaching my people, how do you build trainings? Um, and the cool thing about that is, I think that once you understand the subject, the only thing that you really need to figure out what to offer in a training is someone who doesn't know the subject because you don't know your own gaps and running it by a newbie can really, really help. The bigger question is how do you present that information? And um, that talk goes over basically four different structures for trainings. And every training I've ever seen follows one of these four structures. And it basically goes from what is the easiest put together to what's the most effective for your audience. Um, and to give you a little preview, what we see way too much of, especially in academic and academic technology, is what I call the survey method, which is where somebody gives you a list of facts and procedures and expects you to learn from that. Um, it's certainly the easiest to build, but it's the hardest to learn from. And then it goes to discuss mental models and how setting someone up with a mental model helps them not just retain information, but know how to apply it and link it to things that they're trying to do. So um, I'm really hoping that that resource will be useful to you. When these slides get posted, you'll have that link. Um, but it's hopefully a pretty easy fo to follow deck on its own. I'm afraid the talk wasn't recorded because it's internal, but you're welcome to shoot me some questions. And the deck includes a whole bunch of great resources on how to build mental models, um, including the Farnham Street blog, which is fs.blog. And that's all about learning and applying mental models, which is great because for those of you who aren't really familiar with mental models, um, the idea of a mental model is that it's a way to 
kind of formalize and transmit to other people the way that you work with a certain kind of knowledge or experience in your head. Um, usually we're very accustomed to transmitting facts to other people, but facts don't always help on their own because you can teach someone a process or a set of facts, but those only work as long as they don't have to work with any facts you don't, haven't taught them or as long as the process doesn't need to change because of a change in the needs or the environment. With the mental model, what you're sharing is your understanding of the subject matter so that when the facts change or the process needs to change, people are more able to adapt to their thinking. Um, so I really hope that that'll be useful to somebody. So do we have any live questions or should I go through the rest of this list? Uh, no questions so far. No chat. questions so far. Well, this one, I'm going to throw at Daniel because it's so convenient that he showed up because someone asked me, how do cyber apprenticeships fit in? So that's a good question. And I think relating to what you just said about facts is I can present somebody the complete list of instructions on how to do something. But most often that doesn't tell you why you want to do it or under one circumstances that you might want to look for alternatives or not do it at all. And a cyber apprenticeship, a good one, um, is not just teaching somebody how to do something, but when to do it and why. Um, there are a significant number of operational choices and decisions that you make that are very circumstantial, but there are also some industry best practices that aren't necessarily written down anywhere. And so if someone says, well, it's a lot less expensive to sit there and build a, a storage system that's just a big array of disks. Someone might say, yes, but two years from now, when you don't have a RAID and a drive fails, you're going to pull your hair out. Mm -hmm. And so uh, a good apprenticeship should always have that element of allowing someone to pick up institutional knowledge that's available and or uh, current practices and thought processes. I'd also add that another important thing about apprenticeships is they help people understand the process of doing these sorts of things with a team. One of the problems that I see in people who come fresh out of their education is they've never had to build something that somebody had to maintain later or where they had to communicate expectations to other people and keep everybody on the same page through a long-term project. That's also a very good point. When we get people in fresh out of school, they're just not used to documenting what they do, uh, filing change reports, um, working to expectation from uh, not just a, a project manager, but coworkers who have um, ideas and practices they expect to be used when things are built so that they can maintain it. Um, the, a good apprenticeship also gives uh, people exposure to the culture, the working culture that's there, um, and some of those expectations, especially on the unstated ones. Um, mm -hmm. some, sometimes people are kind of clear when you come in, you're going to do this and that, but there are sometimes things that aren't stated. Um, uh, in a development team, you might have somebody saying, this is our coding style. Well, for system engineers, there's a deployment style, perhaps. A friend of mine went to a conference recently and um, a bunch of people were there, all of whom were managers or administration of some kind. And a bunch of them were complaining about how hard it's getting for them to onboard new employees who are coming to them fresh out of school. And they're like, are we just getting old and crotchety and really biased? Is this the kids these days hindsight bias or has something really changed? And as they're talking about it, finally, one of the conference leaders made them all stand in a circle and facing each other so they could see the whole group. And he said, when you get, when I say the number that is the age where you had your first paid job that was not doing chores at home for your parents, I want you to raise your hand. And everyone in the room who was like 70 years or older, the age was less than 10. You had these four and five-year-old boys bundling grain in the fields. You had these little girls who were tutoring younger children or acting as what you used to call mother's helpers, where they'd go and help other ladies in the neighborhood with their canning or their sewing projects or cleaning up in the kitchen or whatever. So they had an extra pair of hands and they'd make, you know, a little bit of spending money. 
And then you got to professionals who were a little younger than that, and they all started working around age 10 or 12. You had the babysitters and the paper boys, and one guy who said that when he was young, he was very proud of the fact that because he was so tall, he got to wash windows at a relative's full-service gas station, which earned him a lot of extra money after, uh, after school because he got good tips. And then when you get to people who were a little younger, um, maybe in their 40s, early 50s, they started working around the time they were 16 because that was when they were saving up for their first car or to go out with friends who had started driving. And when you get even younger than that, when you hit around my age in the 30s or people who are in their 20s now, they didn't get their first job until they graduated college. And so the problem is real. It's not all in people's heads, but we have people who are 28 years old who have the same amount of work experience as a 10 year old a couple of generations ago. Um, that 10 year old didn't have a lot of technical work experience, but they knew how to communicate with their boss. They knew how to manage a task and get it done. They knew how to ask for help when they needed it. They'd gotten all of these really rough bumps in their early years. So by the time they were 28, all of that was old hat because they had years and years and years and years of experience at it. Um, and that's pretty scary right now. And internships are a great way to get some of that in for people before they are really trying to jump into a career path full force. I wish that we had more of it um, because early work experiences make a massive difference to what people's experience is trying to start a technical career or any career. So that's my little soapbox, more early career experience. Um, anything else before I keep going down this list? Uh, no, I just thank you for that observation. I hadn't actually heard that before, and it's not within my experience. For somebody my age, I hadn't considered the fact that younger people just may not have been in a work environment at all until much later in their life. Yeah, my son's 17, and everywhere locally he's applied for a job, they said that they don't hire under 18s. Whereas I started working when I was very young. And granted, I grew up in an impoverished community. So you, if you wanted to go to school, you started working very young. So your family had the, the money that you could go to school. But um, the, uh, for me, it was just crazy. They just have a blanket policy of not hiring 16-year-olds and 17-year-olds. Who knew? Um, but it's a massive culture shift. So, uh, okay. Um, well, here's another one. Um, so these two things I'm going to separate a little. Someone asked, would you talk a little bit about cyber awareness and non-technical professional development growth? So um, I'm not sure what they mean about cyber awareness in this context. For some people, what they really mean is cybersecurity awareness. And for some people, they mean um, the awareness of how technology fits into the non-digital world. So if anyone who's actually on the call and not just waiting for the video asked this one, feel free to pipe up and clarify. Um, otherwise, I'm going to jump into the non-technical professional development growth, especially because this is one of my sort of um, favorite soapbox things. Um, it kind of drives me crazy that in our technical fields we provide so little career growth and instruction and coaching for people on the non-technical parts of our jobs we still need to be good communicators we still need to manage our time wisely um, we still need to be able to prioritize we have all of these tasks in common with members of other fields but for some reason in the IT fields we're less likely to get coaching and training on it explicitly um, I was really, really lucky in that coming up um, as a young person, I didn't only work in IT. I worked in IT, but I also vo volunteered for almost 10 years at a psychology center. And I also volunteered in um, search and rescue under an amazing guy who uh, worked with Army SOCOM, Special Operations Command, for quite a while. And um, so I had some really incredible non-technical people teaching me communication, teaching me leadership, teaching me how to set expectations. Um, I was forced to learn to manage my time well and to set priorities. And let me tell you, search and rescue, being the medic and in charge of triage teaches you how to prioritize. 
Um, but all of these outside experiences gave me a skill set that I realized that a lot of my peers weren't getting in the IT world. And then I really made a point to try to help the people who work for me gain. Um, because I watch people flail. One of the things I love about the fact that my boss, Vaughn, introduced me to manager tools was I know a lot of IT people who got thrown into management roles with no instruction on how to do it. Um, so I guess without more detail in the question, the advice I'd give in this area is, um, first of all, look out there in sort of the wider business community because there are a ton of good resources. Um, depending on specifically what you're looking for, manager tools and career tools are a good place to look. Um, there are some really popular books worth looking after, depending on what areas of professional development you're after. Um, there's a bullet journal book and the uh, classic, gosh, someone help me. It's the kind of first productivity book that everybody reads and then abandons when they get better at it. But it's sort of the first step. I'm gonna remember it later, um, especially because I just bought it for one of my employees. Um, but um, there's, you know, there's steps you go through. Um, How to Win Friends and Influence People by Dale Carnegie. Um, everybody should read it at some point. Um, Atomic Habits is a good one. A lot of, if you go to this networking and early mid-career talk that I gave at Perk very recently, the notes for that have a ton of suggestions on these things that people should read and look more closely at. Um, because I think really we're light on it and it really affects our work. I'm looking right now at a colleague who's telling me his entire team's overwhelmed and he's a little frustrated. And I think that a lot of it is they didn't pick up good habits. And I've been overwhelmed at times and a lot of times I have to go back to basics and what are the habits I should be using. Um, but at least I sort of know where that base is and what to double down on and work on. Um, so I'm really, really happy that I've had those things and I keep trying to disseminate them to more people. Um, because there are a ton of good books and communities out there. We just need to get them passed around more in our community because it's not talked about enough and nobody needs to be as overwhelmed as I see a lot of my good engineering friends being, and everybody needs to communicate better and everybody needs to listen better. Um, and if you have favorites, feel free to share them here with the chat. I'm sure everybody on this group would, uh, everyone who showed up from office hours is probably interested. So do we have any live questions yet or should I keep going through the list that was submitted at registration? No, we have nothing so far. Sorry. You are a shy <laughs> bunch. Come on, give me at least one live question so I know you're paying attention. Um, so someone asked, what are some recruitment strategies to find and attract a diversity of strong candidates for software, cyber infrastructure, and related science and engineering positions? Um, recruitment is a big part of it. So is your hiring process. One of the big things I see going wrong in our communities is that hiring managers let HR filter applications before they ever make it to the hiring manager. There are probably applicants that you don't know about for your positions. Um, it's a very common thing in higher ed because someone somewhere decided either that we need to save hiring managers time by not giving them this big stack of applications and trust me, we pay less than the private sector, it's not that big a stack, you can read it. Um, or that it would be safer if HR eliminated all of the applicants that they consider problems. The difficulty with that is what you end up with is a stack of applications that tend to all look the same. Because by definition, HR are, not, are generally not people who are highly skilled in technical fields and understand what the most important traits are for a technical worker. So instead of people getting graded on the merits of what makes them a great technical worker, they get graded on the merits that are easiest for a non-technical person to measure. And that tends to be buzzword compliance of their resume, their spelling, and their pedigree. 
did they go to a really good school? Do they have enough degrees and certifications, even if the certifications and degrees are meaningless um, for the particular position? And that puts people in a rough position because the wealthier your background, the better your pedigree. It's not a perfectly true rule, but it's a generalization that generally holds most of the time. Um, the spelling thing I agree with. Um, it, not everyone is an amazing speller, but come on, you're applying for a job. If you haven't had three people proof this, proofread this for you and put it through spell check, you're just not trying. Um, but, you know, if, and I don't care about buzzword compliance, especially because I'm often given resumes where the buzzwords aren't even used correctly to indicate that you understand the technologies you're talking about. So a big thing is, um, we have an agreement at CACR with IU's HR department that they do not screen resumes. They send us every application for every applicant that applies for one of our jobs and we go through them ourselves. We do not let non-technical people screen our resumes. And that's one of the biggest and best changes that we made early on in my tenure at CACR. I am not responsible for it, but I'm glad that it happened. Um, another thing is when you do your outreach, look at the communities where basically reach beyond just the traditional communities. Most people tend to stick a listing on a job board and hope for the best. Um, that's a lot of what we do in the cyber infrastructure community because we're used to it and we have to post job descriptions. The problem is we're highly regulated in how we post job descriptions. And because of that, we tend to post job descriptions that turn a lot of people off and make them think that they're not invited to apply. Um, I've certainly run into this. One of my um, best hires, I think, would not have applied for the job if he didn't know someone who already worked for me, who encouraged him to apply, because he didn't come from an academic background and was not highly credentialed. What he was is someone who's worked in InfoSec since long before InfoSec degrees existed um, and has a lot of technical chops. And he doesn't have a lot of familiarity with the science community, but you can build that. Um, and I'm really glad that I hired him and I'm really glad that my network reached out to him when I reached out to my network. But doing those things really, really helps because unfortunately, um, academic job descriptions are extremely stilted. They tend to be overly formal, and that's part of the requirements of the places that we work. They tend to be um, overly specific as far as background, which makes a lot of people feel unwelcome. Um, I wouldn't have applied for my current position because I'm undegreed. I simply would not have imagined that a research center at a university would have considered hiring me. And I've been very successful in my position and I think I've brought a lot of value to CACR, but I would not have applied if a friend who works at IU had not basically harassed me into doing so. I literally submitted my application to make her happy. Um, and I'm very glad that she harassed me. Uh, so we have to overcome our job ads. And a big part of doing that is doing the person-to-person -person stuff. Get out to your network, go to conferences. Um, when I do hiring, I make sure that I'm at tech conferences and I advertise as widely as possible that I am hiring. There are a lot of hiring managers who are afraid to meet one-on-one -on -one with candidates before the hiring process begins because it thinks they think it is unfair. Um, I make it fair by giving everyone the same opportunity. I announce publicly what conferences I will be at and how to email me for an informational interview. Anyone who is interested in the position can get 30 minutes with me if they request it. And I will answer any questions apart from telling them the questions that we're gonna ask in the interview ahead of time. I tell people what I'm looking for. I tell people what our priorities are. Um, because everyone has access to the same information, I consider it very fair. And it's really gotten people who I think might not have applied otherwise because they were non-traditional candidates to be willing to apply. Um, 
and it has given people who weren't sure that they were willing to work in academia, especially because it's a pay cut for a lot of people, to get to ask the questions that they needed to ask about our culture and how things worked at our institution to make themselves willing to apply. And I think that it's been a huge win for us. Um, what I've stayed away from is a lot of people have done, do demographic-based outreach. They pick a demographic group that they like or want more of and really focus their advertising there and try to sort of avoid demographic groups they don't want. And I'm just not willing to be that much of a social engineer. Um, I think that I have some personal ethical issues with trying to do that because my, my responsibility is to my organization and to get the most qualified candidates possible. So I advertise in all of the places. If somebody's willing to post my job or post me talking about my job, I do it. Um, and the other thing is that it's very, very, um, it's very hard to do that targeted stuff accurately and well and not miss target it. And I just think that using a spray gun has been a lot more effective for me. Um, the other thing is I really, do speak informally publicly about jobs that I'm posting through social media or through um, chats and things at conferences so that people can find me. Because again, the stilted format of our job posts tends to leave people with funny assumptions about what the job is and turn off a lot of the kind of people I really want to hire because they don't know our lingo. So those are the big ones on recruitment. Um, when it comes to the actual hiring process, having a solid hiring process that measures the right things is the biggest thing you can do. And we learned a lot of our hiring process from manager tools. I can't recommend that site enough. Um, and that is because it gives us something that lets us select for the qualities that we really need um, rather than kind of the vague, I, I Culture fit is important, but most people who say culture fit really mean they want an excuse to go along with their gut feeling. And I don't like that because gut feeling isn't reliable and tends to be more based on people's similarity than any measurable win. Whereas real culture fit means that we need these qualities. And in my institution, we decided that a culture fit means someone who has a strong growth mindset because we're always tackling new things we aren't trained for someone who enjoys communicating because we do a lot of communicating about cybersecurity to people who are not themselves cybersecurity professionals. And if you don't enjoy those challenges and you're not prepared to go into them with gusto, if you want to avoid non-technical people, you're not going to do well here. Um, and people who love learning. So when we say culture fit, it's not that we want a gut feeling that we like you. It's that we want evidence that you have a growth mindset that you enjoy communicating, and that you enjoy learning. And so those three things are things that we look for. And so we have a definition of what culture fit means for us. Um, I think that's really important too, because it gets over some of the weird biases and barriers around the idea of culture fit without getting rid of the idea that people being able to get along in your environment matters. Um, I really feel like I'm lecturing a lot. You guys get to talk back to me. I'd love to hear people's comments and questions. Like so, this is office hours, this is informal. <laughs> so, so I would make an observation about the things you've been talking about doing. Uh, mm -hmm. Being able to talk to people, being able to uh, look for uh, fit for culture, things like that. Um, and all I'd make an observation is that in a formal hiring process, you have fairly hard limits depending on your organization right, the campus, uh, the company, whatever it might be, you can have fairly hard limits on some of the things you can do. Um, going out personally as a manager looking for people is one way to address those limits, and I mm -hmm. think it's a good one. Um, I would note that another way, um, and I would say it, it, it's, it's not specifically about our program, but any intern program can also help you address some of those limits. Because for an intern program, you can set the qualifications for participation lower. Mm -hmm. You can set the uh, expectations of skills and things that you already have lower. You can have an opportunity to actually work with people before 
you make a commitment to hire them to see, oh, yeah, they fit in well. They, they understand what we're trying to do. They have that kind of eager enthusiasm for technology. Or sometimes, and this is okay, you'll find that they realize what you're doing is not what they want to do. Mm -hmm. But you've only spent intern time with them getting them to that realization. And it's a great risk reducer um, because you are you don't have an employee that you've made an employee commitment to, but you're also not just depending on the small amount of insight you get to someone through even a rigorous interview process. Yeah. And worse, if you have a broken interview process or an immature interview process, you get almost nothing. Um, you've worked with somebody for at least a couple of months in a summer internship program or a serious amount of time in something that lasts a semester or more. Yeah, and um, the size of your intern program is going to vary by based on the number of people you have, the amount of time you have, and whatever. But if you have any intern program at all, at least it gives you an opportunity to talk to people in that informal and less threatening session. Plus, it gives you that chance to refer people and say, hey, come and talk to us about this, and they can determine well, wait a minute, maybe I have the skills to actually apply for the positions. I don't have to go through an internship. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, anybody else want to chip in? I'm curious what are on your minds the most? Does, what are you guys working on right now with regard to professional development? Like, what are your big challenges? Uh, this is Brian Dobbins from NCAR. Um, I, I would say I, I like what you said about, uh, um, you know, taking control from, from HR. I mean, I, I understand the value of HR, understand the balance, but uh, uh, in our recent uh, um, internship, we, we had a couple of candidates who only answered, I guess, five of the, que of the six questions they were supposed to answer in their cover letter and thus were dismissed by HR. And I'm like, well, maybe they just didn't feel one was relevant. So it would have been nice to evaluate some of those candidates and Getting a little bit of that control back, I think, sounds pretty good. Um, I, I would also say that as another person who I got my start uh, without having a degree and uh, just had somebody who knew me and, and got me into a job, and that, that opened up a lot of doors. So I, I'm also a big fan of uh, looking beyond just the sort of um, caliber of the uh, qualifications and trying to, to gauge uh, enthusiasm and, and personal interest and stuff like that, which is harder to come across. So this, uh, yeah. In general, I'm in broad agreement. I just, I, I, it's good to hear it from other people. So, yeah. Well, thank you. Um, so anybody else? I see we have one person in the room who hasn't spoken yet. Are, any chance we can get you to chime in and tell us what you've been thinking about with regard to professional development lately? Mm, we have a quiet one. We're not getting that one to talk. Okay. Um, so another question that we have on, um, on this list is what kinds of training are in common use for workforce development in cyber infrastructure communities? And um, I think unfortunately, a lot of cyber infrastructure professionals are undertrained because they get hired for their skills and then they might get a specific vendor training on a technology that's being brought in but they're not getting the chance to go out to conferences and see emerging technologies. And they're not getting the opportunities to build internal trainings and train one another. And they're not getting free time to explore technologies. And that's something that is often a struggle in the way that we're funded. I know that for the large facilities that are under big centers and that are not part of universities, it's really hard because there's no concept of what we call base funding or indirects in quite the same way. I know that you guys have some, I, you guys have a substitute for indirects that's cause, called something else, but the time that it gives you is very precious because you, um, it gets eaten up with your grant and contract writing and things like that. Um, I'm able to set aside about 10% of each of my people's time for kind of um, what we call our base funding little slush fund, which is professional development time, grant writing, um, 
or sort of special projects, which is when we kind of do things for the good of the universe that doesn't benefit any of our funding sources directly. Um, such as recently, one of my guys just went with a group that was trying to teach basic online safety to the elderly um, because they found that they were getting a lot of people in old folks homes who were getting scammed and they wanted a cybersecurity person to go along and help teach them how to protect themselves. And he was able to do that because we had that little 10% sliver of time cut out and it only took a few hours to put that together and go present it. Um, we're very lucky that we have that. I think that it's cool that we have a budget, but having the time is even more important than having the budget. Um, anything as a manager you can do to make that kind of regular time and make it an expectation is really, really big because I think especially among your early career folks, it's very easy to see professional development as costing them the time to be productive to look like they're good at their job. And they really need to be doing both. Um, another big thing is setting a good example. Um, I think that bosses don't always talk about our own professional development because we're working on subjects that are um, probably not that interesting to our earlier career direct reports. But what we don't always realize is showing that we're still learning and still doing professional development is a really important example to set, especially for our most junior folks. Um, and the types of things that I wish we were doing more of is industry conferences or conferences in our field. Things like this are great. Um, the networking is just as important as the trainings. Um, more internal training because that's a low cost, high value thing to do because the person building the training is learning as much from trying to cement their knowledge for other people as the people they're teaching are learning. Um, and if your own people are teaching and learning, it's going to be built to something that's valuable to your organization because you have total control. Um, and another thing that I wish that people would make more use of is um, there's a lot out there in books, in self-directed online courses that are really inexpensive and that people are really happy to do if you just give them the time. Um, I bought four of my direct reports a subscription to an online learning service that we have um, a discount deal with at IU and just having that 10% of their time set aside for learning and special projects each one of them is doing a couple of classes where they just spend two or three hours a week working on that and picking up new skills. And it's been really great. Um, so those are all things you can do. And the CICOE pilot in particular, I'll call out, has a workforce development project that's trying to catalog all the things that are available for your low cost to employees of NSF cyber infrastructure projects. Um, and Research SOC is doing a series of webinars if you're interested in cybersecurity skills in particular. Um, we do a free webinar each month that teaches some skill related to cybersecurity for those who are interested. Um, and there are other learning opportunities that CICOE Pilot is working to catalog so people know how to find them. Um, so time and budget are the two, time, budget, and setting an expectation, I think are the three challenges that I hope everybody can work to overcome. So I'm starting to run out of questions here. I have one decent question and one confusing question left. So I want to talk about things that are valuable to you guys. We have about 15 minutes left. Do you want to ask me anything or should we continue with the list? Okay, hearing silence, I'm gonna continue with the list. Um, so the uh, kind of, or the better question is, how can these programs be repeated on campuses? I think a big part of that is information sharing like we're doing today. Um, I highly recommend Daniel's talk. Um, I think that he's gonna be sharing enough information that you could at least start to bootstrap the type of apprentice system that they've been working with at NCSA, which I think, which sounds really amazing to me. Um, and you know that I like it because I fed him one of my mentees and I'm pretty, I guard them pretty jealously. So uh, 
I think that, you know, just sharing what we've learned with each other so we're not all reinventing the wheel is a really big thing. Um, another thing is sharing our failures. We tend to be really good at sharing the things that we're proud of and less good at sharing the things that were not so successful. But when we share our failures rather than just our successes, we save somebody else from making the same failure. When we say, oh yeah, I tried this and I was really disappointed in how it turned out because this, 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 and this. Well, now when another institution over there across the country is thinking of doing the same thing and they start Googling for resources and they find that blog post you wrote or they find that talk you gave and they say, oh, this didn't work out, they now have more information. And that information might be, wow, we're in a really similar position to them. I think we need to rethink this effort. Or it might be, wow, we're a much larger institution than them. I think we can overcome these drawbacks that they found now that we know about them because we can put in more resources or we can spread out this and this between more personnel or something like that. Um, Letting people know what failed and how it failed can really save them a lot down the road. And you've already had the failure. So apart from a little bit of ego bruising, talking about it doesn't cost you anything. And it can be an incredible value to your peers in the community. So, and we're all interested in this subject. So please make a point to network with and meet the other people who are in this talk. I think most of us are on the conference Slack at this point. And just as an add on, um, I may or may not give enough information in my talk for people to successfully stand up their own program. Um, but I am more than willing to work with and help anybody who wants to stand up their own program. Um, especially if there are uh, thoughts or uh, concerns that aren't applicable. NCSA is kind of a unique place because we're a national center and we have hundreds of people that work in our cyber infrastructure. So it's things that are possible for us can't be possible for other people and that's okay. Um, so, but I'm, I'm more than willing to talk to anybody about how we do things and to see if there's some version of that that's more useful or applicable. Thank um, you so much. Sure, yeah, and um, like I said, we'll have all the contact information so I, I'm I said, it's not a problem. Yeah. So I threw up the thank you slide with my contact information in case anybody needs it. I'll also be on the workshop Slack throughout the week. Um, does anybody have anything else they want to discuss in our last 10 minutes? Otherwise, I could try to parse the last question I have here on my list, which is a little confusing. Okay, so the last question that was submitted at registration is what are the emerging technologies and I'm not sure if they're asking about technologies for professional development, like if they're worried about remote training and whatnot during the COVID situation or if they mean technologies we should be pushing out to our people to develop on. And I'm going to assume they mean the latter because I think that there's a lot of material out there right now about teleconferences and running remote trainings and things. Um, I'm going to say the one thing that I've learned about remote trainings that doesn't seem to hit the popular zeitgeist enough yet, and I'm very sad that it hasn't because I, it's so simple and it's, it's lower tech than you would imagine, provide more breaks. Um, people are... Zoom fatigue is real. People are exhausted by teleconferencing regardless of the medium because having a camera on you makes you expend the energy that you would expend if you were on stage. And doing that all day, day after day is exhausting for people. And building in more breaks brings people in who are more attentive and have a better attitude and are more prepared to learn or to share information than if they hadn't had those breaks which is why you'll see we have many breaks scattered throughout today and two days from now, and why we give you a day off in the middle, because we really want people to come in and make the most of the time that they have here. So your most important learning technology for remote learning, take a break. Um, I'm not sure I have the authority to declare that, but I did anyway. Um, as far as emerging technologies to have people learn about, that is so incredibly situation dependent. And that's really why I try to make sure that um, 
from the high level strategic thinking upper management people at my center all the way down to the very early career employees down on the ground everybody has the freedom to do some exploratory stuff because we all need to be discovering what is relevant or what is going to become relevant to our work um there are a lot of things that don't seem that relevant when we start working with them and then they become increasingly relevant very quickly and just having had your fingers in a lot of little pies over time can really pay off um i can think of a number of things where i was involved in an open source project in passing or i went to a talk about a new technology at a private sector tech conference and then I dabbled with it a little for a few hours here and there just because it was interesting and then it showed up on our radar as important and I was able to jump in head first not because I'd worked with it for months or studied it or gotten a certification in it but I knew enough to be literate I knew enough to know where the boundaries were and I knew enough to understand what I reasonably could and couldn't commit to in the short term and that was enough to jump in and we have really developed a culture of all of our people reaching out, discovering things and sort of putting their fingers in pies and testing them out, which means that when new opportunities arrive, we usually have someone who knows something about that new technology and is ready to jump in harder and faster. Um, and that's really important because when something new comes on your radar, too often in our world, the decision to avoid a new technology completely or to jump in head first is made before that technology is fully understood. And so by the time that uh, that question comes up, it's really nice if somebody has heard of the technology, played with it a little, gone to a couple of talks on the technology. If we can count on someone in our team having exposure no matter what it is, we're miles ahead of the game. So um, I realize that's a non-answer. I didn't tell anyone what emerging technologies to focus on because my answer is really don't focus. Take a peek at all of them until you figure out what's relevant. So I hope that that's helpful. And we only have five minutes left. And I'm sure that you all want a stretch and whatnot before you move on. So I'm going to hang out here for the last five minutes in case anybody needs anything from me. But um, you can find me on Slack, you can find me via email, and I'm going to get these slides to Wendy so that you can click through those links and find the resources that I talked about. Have a great afternoon or whatever time of day it is for you.